The American philosopher Harry Frankfurt passed away on July 16, 2023. In the broader public, he was most famous for his work on bullshit. He wrote an essay with this title in 1986, but it garnered a reputation when Princeton University Press published it as a very small book in 2005, making it a New York Times bestseller. Because it was originally just a normal philosophical essay, it was quite a stretch to publish it as its own book. But Princeton managed to get it done by being very generous with the line spacing. Really generous. The book was a phenomenal success, and rather unusual for an academic philosopher, Frankwood was invited to give countless interviews on bullshit, even in late night shows. In his essay, Frankfurt analyzed the phenomenon of bullshit and offered an argument why bullshitters are even worse and more dangerous than liars. So what is bullshit and how is it different from lying? According to Frankfurt, what makes bullshit a distinct phenomenon is that bullshitters don't care about the truth. They simply try to advance their own agenda with whatever means necessary. And for that, caring about the truth or falsehood of what they say is simply irrelevant. In that way, bullshitters are different from liars. In order to tell a lie, the liar has at least to know the facts of the matter to actively go against them. In that regard, they are paying attention to what is true. Lying is typically bad, of course, and especially in a political context often detrimental to society. But according to Frankfurt, the bullshitter is even a greater threat to the public, as they don't even give any consideration to the facts of the matter. Bullshitting is also epistemically worse and more disrespectful. The liar has to at least pay attention to what the truth is, whereas the bullshitter couldn't care less. In Frankfurt's research career, the essay on bullshit was rather a side project. Early in his career, he first did research on the philosopher René Descartes and the topic of rationality. But among his philosophical peers, he became most famous for two contributions in the free will and moral responsibility debate. The first contribution was within the debate on moral responsibility. More specifically, Frankfurt attacked a widely established principle in ethics, the principle of alternate possibilities. It states that a person is morally responsible for what they have done only if they could have done otherwise. That's quite intuitive. If there's nothing else you could have done, how can you really be made responsible and be blamed or punished? But Frankfurt came up with a counterexample to disprove this principle. As the principle states that a person can never be responsible if they couldn't have acted otherwise, a single counterexample to this principle should be enough to disprove it. So Frankfurt needed to think of a case where someone has moral responsibility without the ability to do otherwise. These kinds of examples became famous as so-called Frankfurt cases. Here is one of them. Imagine Cortex, an evil neuroscientist who has a grudge against Crash. He wants to shoot Crash but does not want to risk doing it himself. By chance, he discovers that Jin also wants to shoot Crash. So Cortex comes up with a plan to implant a chip in Jin's brain. The chip gives Cortex control over Jin's goals and intentions. Luckily for him, Jin wants to shoot Crash anyway, so he doesn't need to use the chip to intervene. But if Jin were to chicken out at any point, the implanted chip would allow Cortex to manipulate him into shooting Crash anyways. But sure enough, Jin goes on to shoot Crash out of his own volition. Why is such a weird example? According to Frankfurt, it shows that moral responsibility does not require the ability to do otherwise. After all, since the chip was implanted into Jin's brain, he never had the ability to do otherwise. Either he shoots Crash out of his own volition, or Cortex will make him do so. Either way, there is no alternative type of action in this stipulated example. But still, Frankfurt would say given that Cortex did not intervene, it seems that Jin is perfectly morally responsible for what he did. So, the principle of alternate possibilities has to be wrong. Frankfurt cases have been used in the debate on free will, determinism and moral responsibility. Determinists think that because people can never do otherwise, moral responsibility cannot exist. Frankfurt, by using such examples, wants to suggest that compatibilism is more plausible. People can be morally responsible even if they cannot do otherwise. This argument led to a huge discussion and way too many versions of Frankfurt cases. Some philosophy journals even decided not to publish papers relying on such cases anymore. But is Frankfurt's argument plausible? The literature has found no agreement yet, but I think it's unlikely. At least from the perspective of the free will skeptic, who denies that there can be responsibility if everything is determined, this won't work. After all, Frankfurt simply gave us a case where he would intuitively endorse responsibility without alternative possibilities. But one immediate problem is exactly that judgment. Even if it were true that people make responsibility judgments in those cases, why are they right in doing so? If they were simply to say that's my intuitive assessment, 
then this is question begging, at least against the free will skeptic. So there would need to be an independent reason to endorse that intuition, which the Frankfurt cases alone do not provide. If determinism were to be true, Jin's desires and wants would ultimately be outside of his control, thus he would never have responsibility in the framework of the critic. If determinism were to be false, he would have alternative possibilities in the moment before shooting crash. So Frankfurt's criticism doesn't apply. This dilemma is a serious problem for Frankfurt's argument. Enough with Frankfurt cases. The other big area in which the American philosopher was influential, at least in the analytic tradition of philosophy, was his work on the related topic of freedom of the will and the concept of a person. Philosophers have for a long time been interested in the question under which circumstances an action is free and what gives us humans that special kind of status that we love to give ourselves. Personhood. Frankfurt tried to answer both with the same theory. For this, Frankfurt proposed a hierarchical structure of a person's will. On the basic level, there's stuff that humans and other animals also want. We can just call them wills or desires. Among these, we can distinguish normal desires and those that are effective. We might want a lot of things, like getting in shape or being a successful YouTuber, but not all of these are effective desires that impact our actual decision making. Desires of the first order are nothing particularly special, and Frankfurt suggests that we shouldn't pin the concept of a person on these, as this would make the concept very deflationary. But beyond these first order desires, there are also desires of the second order. Frankfurt writes, Someone has a desire of the second order, either when he wants simply to have a certain desire, or when he wants a certain desire to be his will. If I not only want to get in shape, but also want to be the kind of person that wants to get in shape, I have a second order desire. These can of course conflict with first order desires. My second order desire to want to get in shape might be in conflict with the effective desire of wanting to eat unhealthy food. In that case, I have a second order desire, but not a second order volition. Second order volitions are where the magic is at. I want to get in shape. I want to have the desire to want to get in shape. And I want my desire to get into shape to be effective and make me go for a run. This would be a case of a second order volition. Frankfurt says that he considers these second order volitions to be the cornerstone of personhood and also of freedom of the will. In this context, Frankfurt coined the term wanton. A wanton is someone who in principle can have second order desires but does not have second-order volitions. That means that wantons simply don't care what their effective desires turn out to be. To explain the difference between a person and a wanton, Frankfurt takes the example of two people with addiction. The so-called unwilling addict has the second-order desire not to want to have the desire to take the drugs. But within the conflicting first-order desires to take the drug and not to take the drug, the drug desire always wins out. What makes the unwilling addict a person is the fact that he would want his first order desire not to take the drug to be effective, even though it never is. Because of this structure of his will, he merits the classification as a person. The wanton would be someone who does not care which of his desires are effective. In Frankfurt's words, they might as well be animals in that regard. They might have a desire not to take the drug, but they don't really care which desire wins out the battle. If so, they don't warrant the status of a person. There are several objections that can be raised against Frankfurt's account of personhood and free will. First, to his own admission, it is quite a gradual concept. People can have some second-order volitions, many or barely any. If that is true, the concept of a person will become quite messy. Relatedly, it might be too exclusionary. As Frankfurt himself says, he does not want to have a concept of a person where all animals would be covered by that concept. That's a problematic claim in itself. But even granting that, to his own admission, newborns, many children and even some adults don't classify as persons. It is unclear why we would want such a theory of what a person is. And for a last point, it is unclear how morality is connected to his concept of a person. Many people connect fundamental moral rights to the status of a person. That's also why they might want to expand it to non-human animals. If in Frankfurt's view not even all humans are persons, then he needs to explain how all of them still should have fundamental rights, if these are not connected to their status as a person. These are some of the impactful contributions that Harry Frankfurt made in the discussion of free will, responsibility and personhood in the analytical debate. He also did a bit of work on whether equality matters, but because we already did a long video on that, you can just check it out after this video. 
For now, let us know what you think about these issues and Frankfurt's positions in the comments below. If you like these kinds of videos, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more.